<laughs> it's hard to say because there are so many things shaping people, I guess. Well, and also, you have to be careful because if you spend too much time thinking about the, where you come from, roots, history, uh, childhood, you may fall in the trap of nostalgia and romantic and all that. And you know, what keeps people in life is not what you have done, what you have been, but what you will be and what you will do. So it's a, something that is a, is, a, is a dangerous exercise to think too much about our roots. But at a certain age, become natural. So maybe I should say that I was shaped by, first, by my family. My father was a builder, a small builder. And you know, it's quite important because, you know, when you are six, seven, eight, nine years old, and you start to prefer to go on site more than going on the country house, that's a good beginning. So I guess this is a part of the shaping. It's a kind of, there are so many things shaping people, especially in the childhood, in the, in the teenage. And, and then, of course, I guess C is, has been shaping me. C in the sense that I was born in a city of sea water, salty water, in Genoa. And uh, you grow up with this uh, not big city, quite small, industrial, uh, arbor. And you keep going up and down, walking, watching, you know, romantically watching the sea. And the sea is like a mysterious place to go, you know, one day, you know. So you grow up with this idea to run away one day and to discover the rest of the world. The sea is a quite uh, interesting um, uh, invitation to discover it. It's natural. It's not just an invitation to run away. It's also, it's also about light, especially the Mediterranean Sea. It's about light, it's about the sound, it's about taste, it's about uh, vibration, it's about voices, because the Mediterranean is like, it's like a soup. It's not a sea. The Mediterranean is like, like, uh, like uh, a consommé of different cultures, eh? from North to African to Eastern to Western, Spanish. So in some way, this is probably another thing shaping the sea. I don't know, I can go on forever. Maybe, maybe the city where I, 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 I was born and I grew up is a, is a special place because Genoa is a very old city. It's a, it's a city um, of stone, like a kind of... Um, we understand why people were navigating and then come back home, they were finding a good uh, protection in the city, in the little street narrow street. So, so much the sea was open and vast. So much the city was kind of protective. So stone and water are the two elements creating a place, a city of sea. The stone on ground and the water on the sea. So, this is also, you know, there are so many. And when you talk about stone and sea and you talk about the arbor, you talk about ships. And the ships are also very interesting because the ships don't touch ground, they float. I think somebody said, and I think it was right, that when you are eight, nine years old, you already have got everything you need in the life. You know, you have been trapping under the skin the essence of your identity. And, and, and this is not the romantic idea. So it's quite true. I think it's quite true. The truth is that at that age, when you leave your local 
war very intensively. When it's so intense, when desire is so intense, they remain. And so that local becomes your yeah, universal. It's no more local. It's your yeah, identity that you keep with you. And then, of course, you keep growing. I'm not a psychologist, you know, I'm, but, you know, I think that this is what happened. When then you are 18, 19, then there are different values that come over. And the different values are what we normally call cultural value and social. There are two different things that come to help and also invention. In all invention, you start to, to wash your hands. You do something. You start to watch. And you say, oh my God, I made it. You, know? you, you find this mysterious thing that is creativity. And this is not normally when you are 9, 10, 11. It's more like when you are 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. So invention, the pleasure of discovery, the pleasure of understanding the, the, the beauty and the excellence of the world that is around you. Historical, architecture and the culture and painting and art and music, that's great. And equally great is understanding that society is a very interesting thing, community. So you, you understand the value of, uh, of uh, talking to people listening to people, understanding people, discussing with people, and exchanging with people. Those values come a bit later, and of course they shape you, for sure, for sure. Because I remember when I was a student in Milan, and I was, what, 22, 23, 24 years old, this is when you start to wonder about the city. You walk in the street, you talk to people, you discover the, the sky, you discover rivers, forests, <laughs> sea, the vastity of the world. So there are so many things that come to make you, and friends, and friends, and the crossing frontiers, so that you start a friend that are not necessarily doing the same thing you are doing. You start to know friends that write, writers, or poets, or musicians, or I don't know what else, um, filmmakers, or photographer, And then you start to mix in this beautiful bouillabaisse that is uh, creativity and art and beauty. You start to mix everything. So it's just so difficult to judge what has been most important in all this. The childhood? the teenage, or when you start to become a more civic person, so you start to understand the value. One thing is for sure that architecture is everything coming together. You know. You're very um, shaped by craftsmanship, by your hometown, but at some point when you were a young man, you begin to travel, to study abroad, to discover the world. How important is traveling and meeting other cultures and meeting the world for the socialization of an architect? I think it's so important to travel. It's so important because you know what? what happened. By traveling, you get away from what you're doing. And so you start to have a vision that is more detached. You know, even if you are making a fresco or a painting or a mosaic, hmm, you need to go very close, to stay very close to the mosaic. You need to work on this. And then from time to time, you have to go away. You have to take distance. 
you have to take two, three meters, maybe four, maybe five, maybe ten meters to understand, and then you go back. So traveling for me is this, is that you get away from the picture. You get away from, from what you're doing, and then you can see, you can understand. You take distance. It's, uh, and also it's very important for Italian especially, because you know, Italy, I, I think it's, well, I love my country, but of course I love all the country of Europe. I'm, I feel European. When ask, the, people ask me, where are you from? I say, from Europe. But the reason why I love Italy, especially because Italy is uh, profoundly beautiful, for sure. And beauty is something you get used to. So if you don't go away, if you don't travel, you don't even understand how lucky you are to be born in Italy. <laughs> how lucky you are to be born in a place of culture. I'm not just talking about Italy. I'm talking about our world, civilized world. People, young people should travel to understand how lucky they are to be born in a place where you live on the shoulder of giants. You live on the freedom that was built up in centuries, you know. The civic value are important. And civic value, beauty, and all this are coming together. So travel is important also because you get, by getting away, you take distance. Especially young people should do that because they take this and then they discover how lucky they've been <laughs> to be born in a civilized place. So it's a, it's a part of the, and also of course it's important to understand diversity. And to understand that diversity is a value. It's not a problem. Diversity is a value. It is the way to, to grow and uh, to learn and, uh, and and to steal, to take. Well, stealing, I know, is not nice. But at one condition, if the condition is that you give back, it's not that bad, stealing. I'm mean, taking. You know, I have, we have so many young people in the office here, here in Genoa, everywhere. And I, I, what I, because they are coming. We have a little foundation, and we have Every year, 20, about 20 people coming, young people from everywhere in the world, and they stay with us six months. And what they tell them all the time, take, take, take away. Don't wait for us to give you, take. Well, possibly give back uh, one day. But this idea that uh, mm, traveling make, make possible this, that you notice, know people, you see things, and you, and you bring on, you bring with you, you put in a memory, in the back of the brain, there's a special place for memory, and you trap in that storage of picture, you trap so many things. So, so it's uh, so important for all those reasons. It's, uh, it's, not, it's, it's, it's not because of being, being a tourist is good. Of course, why not? But uh, because it makes you a better person, a person that is more open to understand. Learning language, by the way. Learning language, talking language is very important because, well, I'm not a very special one, but I speak three languages and I think it's essential. Maybe three or four languages is not that bad because then Talking language means that you understand better what you are talking about, what, what is happening. So I think this, this is a very important, um, it's probably one of the most important things at a certain age. And you know what happened, by the way? At my age, I still travel. Well, I, I have a very funny life because I live mainly in Paris, but I spend every, every month at least one week in New York, Los Angeles, in that part of the world, and one week in general or traveling somewhere else. But um, it's uh, very funny because as an architect, at a certain age, when you travel, you feel home everywhere. That's very funny. And next uh, Saturday, I go to New York. Uh, 
When I'm in New York, I'm a New Yorker. When I go to Berlin, I'm a Berliner. When I go to Hanoi, I'm Vietnamian. I'm from Vietnam. And it's very simple, why? Because as an architect, you cannot be a tourist. You need to understand people. You need to know. You need to listen. And you don't just listen to people, you also listen to plays, because plays have a story to tell, a big story. But we have to listen. So, you know, traveling as an architect is never traveling in the surface. It's also on surface because you need, but then you need to be, you need to love the place where you are. And so if you love that place, you are, you feel home. <laughs> you were born in 1937. So when you started traveling as a young man, it was still a Europe that was in the wake of the Second World War. It was a Europe in ruins. Do you think that this shaped your perspective and your motivation to become an architect, to build things up? Uh, yes, certainly. But the main motivation was very simple. My father was a builder. I got to be a builder. That's end of transmission. That was the simple thing. And actually, I got to become probably more like an engineer more than an architect. But because also I wanted to run away from home, I preferred to be architect because then I got to go somewhere else. That's all. That was the story. So this was number one. I got to become like in a, like a growing a circus. You become an acrobat. If your father is an acrobat, you become an acrobat. <laughs> so it's very simple. But of course, then, you start to understand why being a builder, architect builder, a civic person, hmm? why is it so important? Yes, it's about building, it's about construction, it's about reconstruction. But of course, when you are eight or nine years old, you don't think about reconstruction. When you are that age, at the end of the world, I was, I was seven or eight years old. At that age, the only important thing is that every day is much better than the day before. So you grow up with this idea that time going makes things better. Simple, simple. The food every day is a bit better. And the streets are more clean. And your mother is more smiling. And your father is more relaxed. And you know, the food is better. Everything, you know, so you grow with this mad idea that time going makes things beautiful, better. That is normally called optimism. That is, by the way, one essential part of being architect, for sure. That's for sure. So you grow with this idea. But this is more instinctive. You don't have to think about that. You bring, still now, you know, still now. When something trample, I think that at the end it will be better. Something will happen. But, but there is one thing anyway I have to, to say that, I have to say something about this. Uh, that after, when you grow up, you realize that building, making building for people is a very decent gesture of peace. It's exactly the opposite of demolition, of destruction. And then you find that maybe something comes back in your memory from that moment. Because you, you, I didn't suffer about the war myself. When you are five, six years old, you don't suffer. You are your parents, they take care of you. But, uh, but at the end of the day, you grow with this uh, pacifistic idea that making good building is a gesture of peace. You make building that become a place for people to gather, to stay together and to discover tolerance and to enjoy diversity. So this is what you are as an architect. You make place for people to stay together. And so in some way, it's true. I mean, being born in the war, after the war, 
maybe not immediately after that, but in the time you grow up with this idea that's always there. War must be abolished. There's nothing else. Abolished. Uh, slavery was abolished. You know, so it's, a, it's absolutely clear. You grow up with this idea. And making building, good building, is a civic gesture. It's a gesture of peace. And continuing down this lane, you grew so old that you experienced the breakdown of the division of Europe, the breakdown of the Berlin Wall, and then you were the architect forming the Potsdamer Platz, which was a ground divided by east and west, and you started kind of filling up this space, this empty space. Well, you find yourself, if you are lucky, and if you find yourself in the right moment, in the right place, you find yourself very much in connect, connected with those things. You know, as an architect, you always witness a moment. Hmm? You don't change the history. Architects don't change the history, but they witness the change of the history. In in some way, even even Saint Pompidou, not far away from here, was a change in history. But we didn't change the history. But some something like that got to happen at a certain moment. So. And something like falling the, the, the wall of Berlin got to happen. And it did happen suddenly in 89. So, of course, this was a competition, as usual, because everything must be competition, and everything has been a competition in my life. Berlin was a competition, like Bobur was a competition. Everything is a competition. Why not? So, it's true. You find yourself in the place where you don't change the history, but you, you witness the change of the, in, in the history. And this is true for many, many, many things. I mean, even now, even now in, in New York, we are working on, with Columbia University in Ireland, West Ireland, that is the north periphery of Manhattan. And we are working on a new campus, and a piece of design we are doing now is a global center for all the issues that are, all the global issues, from water to clean water to energy to microbanking and all that. And this is also fundamentally making building for something that happened because the world is ready to make happening. So you know, it's you, 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 you. Of course, you don't change the history for sure, but you give a shape to the change. You make a building that are shelter for the change, for that change. And uh, that's the reason why making public buildings so important. We have just finished in this uh, in this town in, in Paris, the new house of justice. You know where? This is on the north of Paris is in probably very close to the most dangerous banlieue of Paris, periphery of Paris, is Port de Clichy, Saint-Denis, the north. And the idea, well, that is not my idea, of course, it was a political idea, a good political choice. The idea was to make a so important piece of a public life, like a house of justice, with 2,000 judges and 10,000 people every day, not in the center of the city, but in the, in the periphery of the city. And this is another big thing happening. And of course, you are not the one make, making this inevitable. History is making this inevitable, because city must take care of their peripheries, because this is their future, or their end, if they are not careful. So, but as an architect, and if you don't, uh, spend the time in, uh, in the stupid things, then, then you, you end by finding yourself in those positions. Let's talk about architecture. Um, we already 
mentioned that you were growing up by the sea and if I look at a sailing ship there's a certain lightness about it and you can find other issues like you're discovering new frontiers you're seeing the light and the horizon the play of light and looking at your architecture I also besides lightness I discover a certain sense for craftsmanship for engineering and at the same time I would have a hard time saying there's a handwriting or a approach that always repeats itself it's very individual buildings that you have done <laughs> it's a very funny profession architecture because in some way of course it's art but is art at the frontier between art and science and so many things you know being an architect means that you have to be a good builder for sure you need to be a good craftsman you need to know how to put things together you need to know how to fight against the force of gravity you need to know how to put things together so you need this that you can call technicality, but it's not just technicality, it's more than that, it's invention, it's, a, it's the art of making building. But it doesn't, it's not enough, because in the same time you are not just a builder, you are also a civic person. So you make shelter for human beings and human communities, and this becomes even more interesting, because then you make buildings that are for people to stay together and to share values. That is the beginning of uh, maybe making a better world. So this is more social. It's more about, uh, sometimes about protest, about protest as well, you know. And, uh, and this is more social. But it's not enough because, you know, you can be a good builder, you, good for, you do for a good reason, but then you are still looking for something that is almost impossible to grab hold, that is beauty, poetry. It's not something good to talk too much about that because poetry is one of those things that disappear as soon as you talk about that, <laughs> you know. So, but to be honest, of course you look for that, look for that. Beauty is not just a, a cosmetic value. Beauty is a very profound idea. It has to do with uh, so many things. It has to do with discovery, with, uh, with, with, with light, with uh, space, with uh, compression, with uh, expansion, with the shadow and light and shadow. It has to do with so many, and the sense of lightness. Maybe eventually with what something that is called language. And language is something incontournable in French, you say, that you cannot miss. Well, it doesn't matter. You can be a good writer, but if you don't know how to put words one after them, if you don't know how to put air between words and rhythm, well, you should better change profession, you know. The same thing if you are a filmmaker. You know, every art has a different language, but language is essential. Even if you are very good, even if you are very inventive and you, and you are doing something right, but you don't know how to put this in language, in the good language. Um, in other words, if you are missing the capacity to create emotion, then it doesn't work. It's not enough. So it's a very funny, complicated job because you have to be a poet at 9.30 in the morning. At 10 o'clock you must become a builder. 11, you may need to be a social, a social animal. And maybe sometime, maybe you should also think about budget and running the team and maybe at three o'clock you become psychologist because you have somebody in the, in, the, in the crisis in the office. You have to talk to people. You have so many young people around. So you also become a teacher, maybe at four o'clock. And then you become again a poet. And then again, and this is what you do. So you're like, a, you keep changing. But you keep changing, but you are still the same, of course. 
Uh, so this is a, what do we call in France the, a fil rouge. The fil rouge is the red line that is connecting all those things. So you can keep changing like a good actor, but at the end of the day, you are just taking care about one thing, that is the project. That's, that's what you're doing. So, you know, it's a, it's a very funny profession where you have to move from those, probably it's quite the same for everybody. I mean, even a filmmaker is like that, I guess, I guess. Every profession need that. But um, architecture, you need really to jump from one to the other very quickly. And we mean that the same hour you change function three or four times. In this focus on the project, I know two elements are very important for you. One is kind of the drawings, the sketchings, and the modeling. You're famous for that. And the other one is that you're working with teams. This is called a building workshop and you don't want it to grow beyond a hundred persons, you want to know everybody, so there's a certain familiarity uh, in this house. Why are those elements, the sketching, the drawings, the modeling and the teamwork so important? I don't know. Maybe it's a bit of a snob, maybe. No, it's, it's part of your essence. I mean, uh, first I, I, I spend my day doing this, sketching and touching things and, you know, because this is what is making me happy, honestly. There's nothing generous in that. I'm just happy. I like, I like to do that way. I think it's also very good for the project. And the idea of the team is very simple. I, I'm a social animal myself. I grew up with the first occupation of university in Milan in the 60s. Well before May 68 in Paris, we have been occupying university in 62, 63, 64. So I grew up with this idea that you go around, you talk to people, and you try to understand, and uh, social life and um, the art of listening is part of, of the game. So there's nothing theoretical about that. It's just in my skin. In my, and I have to say, this is very enjoyable, especially my age, because in the office, well, we are not 100, unfortunately. I, you know, they never tell me the truth. Well, actually, more like I under 60 or something like that. But anyway, I still know people. I still know people. But in the office, I have a 10, partners and I have 25 associates and some of those people are working with me since 30, 40, 45 years. Shunji Shida in Genoa is working, has been working with me 48 years, you know, and we don't even need to talk each other. We just watch each other and we just make a gesture and, and it comes. It's a kind of, and also ethics are very important. Nobody here talk about ethics, but of course it's a kind of um, clear statement. We don't do anything wrong. We never do something that is not focal to the project and to the ethic of the project, of course. So all this is, is, a, is particularly enjoyable at my age because you create, uh, you have created and the people help you to create I'm not the owner of the office, by the way. I'm, I'm, I have my, my part of the property, but the other people share the property. So, but you enjoy a position where in the morning I come to the office, I don't have to think about anything. And the music starts, you know. The dance goes. I come to the office and I, I sit there, 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 and, and the ping pong starts the ping pong start, and this is wonderful. And this is also because, you know what, creativity is uh, only possible when you share creativity. Um, otherwise, and here yeah, nobody take accountancy of who got the idea, you know, nobody, more that, nobody does that. It's a kind of, it became quite natural. You are in a meeting, you say things, you know what I say to young people? Please, can you, de can you say something stupid? Can you come on 
sort out. Take the bravery, take the courage to come out. You know how, what, you, what you need to be creative? You just need to decide to become creative. You just need to, be, to, 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 to try. And of course, I keep telling young people, don't worry. Anyway, we stop you. If you do something, if you say something stupid, don't worry. But if you say 10 things, and the five of them are not stupid, it's already good. It's, a, it's already quite good. So this is the sense of the, of the teamwork. And it, it is, is absolutely clear. On the sketch and on the modeling, it's very simple. Everybody uses computer, thanks God. And we use computer, of course. We make a complicated job everywhere in the world. So computer is a very good system. To, um, but the computer are a bit stupid. And you have to tell them exactly from where to where to go when you make a line, from that point to that point. But when you start a job, you don't know exactly. So what you do, you take your pencil, and you do this or this. And the imperfection of that dash is exactly what you need, because it is in proportion of the fact that you are the beginning. So you are just exploring, exploring. And sometimes the end goes faster than the brain. The computer needs the brain to tell exactly the coordinates, x, y, x1, y1, and then you go from there to there. But you don't know, really. This is the same thing when you, when you write. When you write, it doesn't matter if you write by computer or by hand, it doesn't matter. But at the beginning, you just throw on the piece of paper the idea. I guess even filmmaking is like that. Actually, I'm sure filmmaking is also about that. It's about just the beginning. So the beginning is always a sketch. And the model is also a sketch. The model is not the final thing. The model is something that gives you the pleasure to watch, to touch, to think, and to go from something to something else. So there's a kind of a pleasure, but also more than pleasure is exploring. You know, there is a writer that I love very much, um, Marguerite Yursenar. She, she said, she wrote, that in, in a creative work, you need the bravery to watch in the dark at the beginning. At the beginning, you don't see the light. You see dark. And then you need, to, you need to stay there. You need to stay there enough time, and after a while, you start to see things. This is also happening when you get in the dark room. At the beginning, you don't see anything, and then after a while, you start to see. So this is a very essential thing. Final question at the end of a fulfilled life and still very active life in architecture. You won all the prizes. You have built famous houses that have gotten all the achievements all over the world. What remains? What is there a legacy? Is there an advice for young people? How do you reflect upon your houses? Are they children spread all over the world? What remains? Well, what remains for me, I don't know, but what, you know, at a certain age, what keeps you in, in life is not what you have done, but what you still have to do and what you have not done. So this is for me. For the other, what we do is exactly what I think we should do. I never been teaching in a school or university, not because I I don't trust university. I think they are a great place for students. But uh, for a number of reasons, I've never been teaching in school. 
Uh, I was too busy. So the idea is very simple. Instead of going to university, we bring people to our office. And this is a kind of a modern interpretation of a very old idea that is called in Italian bottega. La bottega. La bottega is the place where the master of the old man used to teach young people, not by telling, not by, but just a showing, but just inviting to, to lunch or to, to the table. Come and behave well, but um, understand by doing. Because you know, the school can, uh, can teach a lot of things. And thanks God, the school, when they are good, they do very well. But they, ca they cannot teach emotion. They cannot teach joy, enjoyment, or when you are unhappy, you know. So even people, young people in the office for six months, this is what we do uh, per bottega, in the bottega. Bottega is something impossible to translate. I cannot translate in English. Or, uh, it's like learning by doing, something like that, you know. But when they come, you know, and, and they for they study for six months. The first month they are lost. They don't even understand. But then they start to understand that this job is made of emotion. Sometimes you 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 must be you must fight. You must fight sometimes. Sometimes you are enjoying. Why ever you are enjoying, why ever you are not enjoying, you know what what is the what is the point? What is the so people the young people understand the complexity of this of this uh, of this uh, profession. But um, there's little I can I can I can do beyond that. I think it's quite a lot. Unfortunately we cannot do with thousands and million people, but uh, we do we do for for 20 people a year. We have done that for 15 years. That makes already 300 people. We keep going like that. And if you go around in the office, you will find somebody coming from Africa, come, somebody coming from South America, from China, from all around the world. We have, I think, 15 or 20 universities. And every year we select, or they select actually, somebody to send to us. We have a little foundation that we pay for. We don't ask money from anybody. We just, uh, because we are open office and we are working the way we are working, I mean, uh, we, 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 we put part of our asset today. So that's what we do. So it's, um, what, what you can tell young people is not just one thing. There are so many things. But one thing is for sure, this profession is about making a better world. And making a better world is not easy. It's certainly making place for people to meet and to stay together. But it's also looking for beauty. Because you know, beauty is something difficult to find, difficult to grab. It's like the bird of paradise goes away. You try to, but the arm is too short. You can't grab. But if you can grab a bit of beauty and you put in the, in the, in the, in the space, in a building for people, that becomes a quite interesting way to, to, to make people better people. Because this is what art does and beauty. Beauty in a in noble sense, not just cosmetic. Beauty as an art of discovery, and art of music, the art of architecture, the art of filmmaking, the art of science. Hmm? If beauty is there, well, then beauty can change the world. It, can, it will do one person by a time, of course, but it will do it. <laughs>